Hi, hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sarah Carley, for those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to meet. Um, and we are thrilled to welcome Gina Wirth um, as our landscape architecture Hyde lecturer. Um, so Gina will be uh, speaking. Um, the title of her talk is Toward an Urban Ecology. <laughs> and uh, she will share why she believes urban landscape design should be a form of activism. Uh, while Gina is not lecturing, she works as a design principal for SCAPE in New York City, trained in landscape architecture, urban, urban planning, and horticulture. Uh, she draws from her interdisciplinary training to create ecologically rich and culturally relevant landscapes from the infrastructural scale to the site level. So I believe you'll be seeing quite a few really wonderful uh, multi-scalar projects tonight. She leads uh, design projects on, uh, she's been the lead designer, excuse me, on several significant projects at SCAPE. She was on the original Oyster Texture team and was the project manager for SCAPE's involvement in the SIRR, which is uh, New York's climate change initiative or yeah. Is that a good summary? That's a good summary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where she studies large-scale harbor-wide strategies for coastal protection measures uh, that will be utilized in preparing for the next superstorm. She was also the project manager for SCAPE's winning Rebuild by Design proposal and Living Breakwaters, a climate change resiliency strategy for the south shore, shore, south shore of Staten Island. Uh, Gina holds a Master's of Landscape Architecture and a Master's of Urban Planning with distinction from Harvard's Graduate School of Design as well of, as a Bachelor's of Science in Horticulture from the University of Delaware. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you Gina for making the trip out to Nebraska. So welcome. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, is it possible to dim the lights a little bit so we can so I am so pleased uh, to be here this evening. I've, I've come in um, from New York City where our office is based. I'm really excited to be here in Omaha, uh, here in Lincoln. I wanted to say I have family in Omaha, so I have some Nebraska connections. And we also have a University of Nebraska Lincoln graduate in our office. Um, so some of the work that you're seeing today is actually produced by some people coming from your program. So we really appreciate um, the, the great work that you do, and I'm excited to share what we're doing here on the East Coast. So, let's see. Great. So, this is an image of our office. I'm here from SCAPE Landscape Architecture. I'm uh, the design principal uh, of the office. We're about a 30-person office located in Lower Manhattan in New York City. Uh, and while we practice landscape architecture and urban design, we really have a whole diverse a set of disciplines kind of working collaboratively within our office. We have landscape architects, architects, urban designers, planners, and horticulturalists, and many people that actually trained and studied in two disciplines. So I actually studied urban planning and landscape architecture and bring this kind of interdisciplinary expertise uh, to the work that we do. SCAPE uh, is known for a wide variety of things, but I think one of the things that we're especially known for is our approach on the world and this concept of designing for uncertainty. We live in a world um, when while the future is not completely predictable, we can showcase and forecast trends that are happening within our world. We have climate pressures, we have sea level rise, we have increasing storm intensities, especially uh, along the East Coast, and we have urban population rise. And this is the kind of context uh, in, which, in which we work as an office. Um, and I think somewhat, unfortunately, many of these kind of broader trends have, have, have manifested uh, in a couple of key concepts that really shape our work and shape our approach to design and become the issues that we very much try to tackle as an activist practice, every project, one project at a time. Uh, and these issues are climate change, habitat loss, and social inequity, very deeply interrelated and manifest themselves in many ways um, throughout much of the work and the sites in which we study. And I think one of, one of the broader questions that uh, we, we as a landscape practice really tries to address is what can design do? Sometimes design seems uh, kind of outside of these issues which are huge in scale and sometimes called the, the wicked problems of our time. So what does design offer and how do uh, we, we help make positive change in a practice constant a context? We are a private practice, uh, we have clients, we have a number of other um, obligations beyond 
designing for climate change or social inequity. So how do we begin to incorporate these bigger picture principles into all of our work? And so that's what I'm going to speak on tonight. And I think the way that we at SCAFE begin to address these questions is by trying to think about all of our projects as landing on this continuum from research to practice, uh, in that they each em embody and include qualities of research and project within all of them. Um, and we have really focused around the concept of urban ecology as a platform, as a, a way of uh, addressing the world, as a way of designing, and as a a kind of inlet to addressing these larger issues. And so uh, when I say urban ecology, it can be interpreted in many, many different ways. And these next couple of slides are uh, a kind of series of approaches that we take about urban ecosystem design, how we approach it, how we understand it, and how it's reflected in our work. And so we very much, in all of our projects, work to generate ecosystems, uh, forge connections between species, between people and other species. We try to embrace the physical reality of our spaces and our landscapes, which are not always picturesque and beautiful, that sometimes require a redefinition of beauty to fully understand. We try to revive lost landscape systems and look for them, look for them very carefully. Uh, these images are from a, a project in Kentucky that I'll be speaking to later this evening. We try to experiment because we do not know all the answers or really have any clue or any idea. So a lot of our work is highly experimental, highly tactical, uh, and meant to be monitored and studied over time and learned from. Uh, and then finally, I think really critically, we think ecology involves and engages people, that it's not truly urban ecology unless people are involved in some capacity because we are very much a part of these ecosystems and very much a part of these trends. So all of our work really tries to very directly speak to people about these concepts. Uh, and so I think I've, I've cheated and just titled my lecture the same thing as our, as our book that recently came out. But a lot of these practices and principles are really embodied um, in this, this book called Toward an Urban Ecology, which SCAFE is really pleased to have just released only a couple months ago. So I encourage you to, to kind of seek it out. And I show it here today because I've organized this lecture around some of the principles uh, in this book. Uh, the, book, the book really has four chapters that organize our projects that operate across this continuum of design research according to four themes of revive, cohabit, engage, and scale. And I'm going to speak to these four themes today. But I think as you begin to see our projects and our practice, uh, these, these four words in many ways are all interrelated. They all kind of address uh, similar things. So you could probably put any project in any category and still pull out a thread and be able to understand uh, the kind of theme behind it. Revive. So we, we very much believe in uh, reviving and rejuvenating ecological systems and processes in our projects and work. Uh, this, this manifests in more traditional landscape architectural projects. So this is a project in Buffalo where we looked at forest typologies to design a very highly vegetated streetscape uh, in, in Buffalo Niagara Medical Center. Um, this, this relates to climate, trying to revive and understand new urban climates and ecosystems. So this is a landscape on structure that we're working around that's all designed around creating a microclimate that protects from the harsh winds of the Hudson River. Uh, and then revive also relates deeply to water. Uh, we have a whole collection of projects that are all based around water systems and both capturing, directing, diverting, and uh, storing and holding water in the urban environment. So while this project does not appear to be a water project, it's a small library uh, scape designed, the, the kind of expansive, flexible streetscape that's adjacent to it. That street is actually over the library basement, and it's it completely porous. The water is filtered through these uh, bluestone joints, and it's captured and recycled for irrigation within the project. So even <laughs> when it's not visible on the surface, we're thinking about these kind of concepts throughout all of our work and our built work. But I wanted to, to really illustrate the concept of revive and thinking about reviving uh, lost and hidden landscape systems in a project that we're working on in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, in, <laughs> we, were, we were invited uh, in 2012 to come to Lexington and participate in a competition to envision how the city of Lexington might reveal an urban stream that runs below the city fabric 
uh, and turn it into a linear park <coughs> system and a linear trail system that cuts through the city. And so it was a, a competition. There were multiple design teams on this work. Um, and we came to Lexington to see how this small stream system called the Town Branch uh, could be brought back into the fabric of the downtown. And so we began to look at a whole series of historic maps and the patterns that really shaped this kind of iconic bluegrass landscape. Um, Lexington itself was actually founded along the banks of this historic stream system, so it's really kind of like has these deep ties to the history of the city uh, in the bluegrass region. So you, you might know Lexington, Kentucky for its bourbon and its horse culture. Uh, it's got this incredible bluegrass landscape that's bisected by streams, strong agricultural typologies. So it's really quite a beautiful waterway. Um, however, uh, Lexington also has set up a uh, urban growth boundary. So outside of the urban growth boundary, the town branch uh, is kind of part of the, the iconic nature of the bluegrass landscape. However, inside the urban growth boundary, and especially inside the downtown, the, the stream system has been covered over and turned into a culvert that exists below the ground. So it's no longer visible. Uh, these blue lines, uh, this is the, the city of Lexington, these blue lines show where the stream um, is today. It's actually in two culverts and it runs from east to west across the city. What's also pretty fascinating is that this, the stream system starts here. So this is not a river that actually moves to the city. This is a stream that is purely fed by the urban runoff of Lexington. So it's quite unique. It actually daylights right here in a very large, large parking lot area. But this is it. This is what urban waterways look like in our cities. They're invisible. You don't even see them uh, in many capacities. This is a state highway. It's, uh, it's called Vine Street. It cuts through the middle of the city. And below Vine Street is uh, Town Branch. So the water that comes from the city throughout the storm sewer network, this like underground urban infrastructure, is the water of this stream. They're, they're one and the same. And then below the ground, below Vine Street, this is literally what we were invited to come reveal and turn into a, a wonderful part of the downtown uh, historic fabric. So in many ways, it's quite a challenge. It is a perennial stream, but it's a very small body of water during the dry months. It's uh, very responsive to uh, the, the climate and the rains. Um, it's in the wetter months, it has more water. In the drier months, it has less water. Uh, but, it, but it's truly a kind of untapped, um, water body that, that is, that's no longer in the collective imagination of the city. And so this was, this was a really interesting project to work on, uh, to kind of come here to the city, look, look at the fabric, look at the stream, understand the region, and then have this question of what do we do? What can we possibly do here? The city is relatively intact. You can't simply dig up the entirety of the, 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 the urban core and daylight this trickle of water. How do we begin to think about how this stream surfaces and what it begins to look like throughout the downtown? Um, so, so Scape came to Lexington and we started really looking at uh, this like larger regional system of geology, the, of karst, uh, which is shown here in blue. And so Lexington, this is the bluegrass region, and there's a reason the bluegrass region and the deposition of karst is kind of one and the same. Um, and it's because the karst is very high in limestone content. It's a very porous limestone bedrock, uh, and it actually helps the bluegrass grow. Culturally, there's rumors that it makes the horse's bones stronger and makes them run faster, and that it filters the water and makes the bourbon taste better. So it's like very deeply tied into the cultural identity of Lexington, as well as being a, a geologic feature. But we were fascinated by it because in a karst hydrologic system, waters of streams don't simply always run along the top of the surface. They often, because the bedrock is so porous, waters can actually move through the rock in this kind of very unique and interesting geologic cross section. So rather than having a stream like where I'm from uh, in Delaware that just simply runs as a linear pattern across the surface, you get streams that start and stop. You get sinkholes, you get boils, uh, you get all these kind of very interesting, very local, very unique water features. And this was really an inspiration for us uh, kind of coming to the city and learning about its geology. We went and saw some of these features. This is a, a blue hole, a moment where groundwater swells um, in one of these kind of cracked porous bedrock fractures and comes up. Uh, moments where you have interrupted stream channels, streams that start and stop. Swallets, where water disappears into um, and appears out of a crack. 
Karst windows where you can look down and see water flowing below you when it rains. Boils, which are kind of naturally occurring, almost like water features or fountains that uh, happen because of upstream water pressure during a rain event. And uh, urban, urban boils, which is the kind of embrace the actual landscape moment, embrace the landscape that we have, uh, moments where the storm sewer and sanitary sewer system actually overflow and kind of interact with these different processes. So this is a very, a very unique system and a, a very kind of modified uh, system in the urban environment. Sorry, it's hard here. Um, and, but what we got really excited about was that this template for this ge geology, this like native geology of how the water moved through the stone, stopped and started, became a really great way to apply the idea of daylighting the stream to the urban condition, where it's not possible to dig a trench down the entire downtown and close streets and close roads. Lexington really needs um, its, its multimodal kind of traffic patterns to stay alive economically, but it would be possible to have water strategically appear and disappear as a template for design. So this became the design inspiration for us um, and became the template for how we, we proposed to weave this waterway throughout the city. So we really looked at four ways that water was expressed, reveal, clean, carve, and connect. Um, the idea that the stream would not be a linear system, it would not have a constant flow, but that you'd see water in multiple different ways as you move throughout the city's downtown. There would be moments of completely revealing the water, creating a, a daylit stream, um, and we would do this in moments where we literally had room. Okay, so uh, in areas where there were larger um, parking lot expanses, we looked at ways of creating more legible park spaces around water while improving and expanding the floodplain and uh, adding different recreational uses to the downtown. So Lexington doesn't really have a large downtown park, so this became a great site for a, a future park that isn't in planning today. Um, moments where the urban fabric didn't allow for large expansive design. You can see the, the culvert here of Town Branch. It's, it's deep below the ground, so it's not possible to explode the entire downtown to reveal this small trickle of water. We decided it would be critical to clean the water of Town Branch before it actually entered the culvert. And so in the downtown, we looked at some of the uh, urban streetscapes and thought about reconfiguring them um, into a series of rain gardens and bioswales that would be significant in size and capture and treat all of the water of Town Branch from the street before it actually went into the water body itself. And this would be done through a system of uh, kind of very porous uh, kind of paving types. In other parts of the city where there was a little bit more room, we looked at ways of diverting some of the water from the culvert, from one of the upper culverts into the lower culvert, but revealing it within those moments and actually creating huge cuts or huge carves out of the city fabric. Um, thinking about activating some relatively unprogrammed space that existed in what, in what is the kind of cultural center of downtown and creating a series of constructed urban karst windows that same moment where the ground peels away and you see the water below could be reinterpreted on this kind of massive urban scale to create a new plaza. Uh, and so this is another uh, piece of this project that's actually under design um, right now, kind of post-competition. So it's, it's very exciting. We call this area Karst Commons and the thought about it as a kind of large scale performance space for the city itself. And then water can be an, an, an uh, incredibly connective element. Um, one of the most critical things about this project uh, is that uh, the, the, the town, branch, town Branch Commons, this linear park space that's beginning to emerge with a pattern of water that is not linear, um, actually links the bluegrass region and the city. So it's not only a connective thread throughout the city, it's a kind of regional thread that brings people from the bluegrass region into the downtown. And so the last portion of the project uh, we called Connect and is really the headwaters of the project. It's where there's the least amount of water, but there's the most amount of pedestrian and bicycle connectivity. Um, so, so for us, I'm just showing this project as a kind of approach, a way of taking and revealing uh, and reviving landscape systems, applying to the site in a very contemporary way. This is not an not a, not a effort to replicate a natural system. It's a way of being inspired by a kind of hidden landscape system that's kind of unique, uh, but really speaks to, to both the ecological history, but also the cultural history of the city. Um, and so another kind of like 
fun thing about Scape that we're, we're really good at. We're really good at working on large competitions that take many, many, many years to develop and build. So we won this competition in 2013. Um, and since then, we've been doing a whole series of studies to help advance this project. Uh, and we are thrilled because state funding was just secured from a couple of different sources, uh, but one of them being a pretty significant tiger grant um, just, just this year. And so we are now uh, leading the design for the, um, the kind of streetscape and pedestrian realm improvements for the work. So one lesson I think today is like, you know, visionary design takes time for implementation. So we're, we're really pushing all of these projects forward in any possible way we can. Um, so as I mentioned, urban ecology involves people. Uh, about engaging people is a really critical piece of our practice um, and how we talk to people about landscape systems, how we talk to people about ecosystems uh, is, is, is pretty fundamental to what all of us do. Um, we think uh, that landscape architecture is a, can be a form of, of activism, of raising awareness about landscapes. This is evidenced in um, some more research heavy work that we do. This is a book project that unfortunately I don't have time to get into great depth tonight. Um, but it's called Petrochemical America, and I recommend uh, you take a look at it. It's an analysis of the southern Louisiana landscape um, and that energy landscape and how it influences our entire nation. I think it's uh, kind of quite, quite relevant um, today. And uh, it was a collaboration with a photographer. And so this is, the, this is a kind of activist project that's raising awareness about the energy landscape that fuels our country. We, we believe in engaging people on a much kind of finer, finer grain. So if you think about landscape architectural practice, um, if, if people, one, understand that you're not mowing lawns, and then two, understand that you might be designing park systems, or you know, what, is, what is landscape, what are you doing? Uh, you, know, you often think about like the napkin sketch and, and how you might transform the napkin sketch into a finalized design that's then built according to your exact specifications. We sometimes try to take the opposite approach, which is really about engaging people and working with people to build spaces uh, that they will steward and own over the long term. So this is a project at 103rd Street, a community garden space where the community was very much a part of the design process and then also worked with a number of different partners to implement and build the park themselves. So sometimes our design work is not about having the napkin sketch. It's really about kind of coordinating that conversation around design and designing a, a kind of kit of parts that can be assembled um, by someone who's not a landscape professional. Um, in, our, in our built work, we often think about intergenerational space as a, a huge driver for design, thinking about this, these ideas and the kind of challenges of, uh, uh, of social, social equity. This is a project in East Harlem. It's, it's maybe you know, more conventionally kind of a park. We call it a plaza in that it's a playground and a plaza and a park mm -hmm. kind of all at once. Um, but it's specifically designed to provide space for different user groups that surround it within a, a one block radius. So it's very micro, it's very neighborhood scale, it's very much social infrastructure for um, a, a NYCHA housing facility, which is the New York Housing Authority, um, a senior housing area, a, uh, a new school, that's kind of a, a sports-based uh, charter school, as well as a new affordable housing development. So this project really tries to create flexible space for those different user groups to not only use the same space, but interact in the same space. It's something that's, that's very, very key for us. But when we also speak about engaging and reaching out, um, we also think a lot about how we talk to people and how we communicate our ideas and our interests um, in, this, in this bigger world. So sometimes we find ourselves being interpreters of ecosystems and of places. And sometimes we have to kind of reach beyond the typical design catalog of plan and section and Photoshop renderings to be able to do that. Uh, and so Scape collaborated on this project, which is called Safari 7, it's an urban wildlife tour. Um, and the design product of this was actually a series of podcasts, uh, working with schools to develop a, um, a kind of audio series of podcasts that describe urban wildlife that you can listen to as you ride the number seven train. So along every stop, you can hear about different urban wildlife interactions that happen. The seven is an incredible line. It goes from Times Square all the way out to Queens. So you know, almost as dense of an urban environment as you can imagine. 
all the way out to uh, where they play tennis in Flushing Meadows, a much more expansive, like large Phragmites marsh. So it's this incredible transect across New York City, and uh, our office worked with um, MTWTF and Jeanette Kim of Urban Landscape Lab to uh, create this podcast tour. Uh, the, the idea of the podcast as a design tool is something that's been applied in our, like our, our more like capital projects and more traditional landscape architectural work. And so I just spoke about the Town Branch project in Lexington, Kentucky, and I spoke about how long it takes to actually implement and help fundraise for a, a large urban capital project. One very small way that we helped move this project along was through this social outreach project called the Town Branch Water Walk which was a podcast walking tour of the hidden path of Town Branch. So it got a lot of people excited um, about the, the, the longer term project, but it was also a water quality and educational tool for the city. Um, so we reached out to the city about getting this very, very small, very incremental um, water quality education grant to do this project. Uh, we work with a whole host of partners. This is Ann Weber, who was at our office leading this project, going around taking pictures and audio recordings of stormwater running into to culverts and underground infrastructure. Um, and we made this web platform, so it's, it's live today. You can go check it out and download all the podcasts. But it's a series of podcasts that follow the path of Town Branch um, and talk about different, uh, both historic and contemporary issues related to water quality and it talks about the kind of future potential of this space to really positively impact the city with the larger Town Branch Commons project. Um, we made a model and we brought it out in a number of different community events and it continues to live in the public library as a kind of interactive tool that you can literally plug into and listen to. Um, but for us, and you know, it's not a conventional design tool, but it's been one of these tools for engagement that's really helped us kind of advance the, the message and our work. So I'd recommend you, you go check it out. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's, it's probably becoming clear that we're, we're very interested in landscape systems, but we're also very interested in the, the inhabitants of them, of thinking about interspecies design and, and, and thinking about like trying to design through the lens of a different species. Uh, so, so cohabit, our cohabit projects are really deeply related to this, of how do we design not just for ourselves, but how do we think about oysters or birds or other species as our clients um, or as in addition to our clients, our other clients. Uh, one, one project uh, that we're relatively well known for is a proposal that we did for the Museum of Modern Art a number of years ago um, called Oyster Texture, where we imagined before Hurricane Sandy happened, we imagined uh, a large scale oyster reef that could help attenuate waves within the harbor and help protect coastal neighborhoods from storm surge. And so for a while, this was just a really lovely idea that people liked. And then Hurricane Sandy happened, and then it became suddenly a very kind of real concept. And is, I'm going to show you another project called Living Breakwaters that takes a lot of these ideas and translates it into um, a, more, a more buildable infrastructure. Um, but we also work on other types, again, of tools of engagement, of ways of communicating this, not only to ourselves as a discipline, but to, uh, to people. Scape believes very strongly in communicating what we do to the average citizen. And so one of the, the design projects that we've worked on is a collaboration with New York City Audubon, uh, which is about creating a series of bird safe building guidelines of like literally thinking through the lens of a bird. How does a bird negotiate the urban environment? What are the potential conflicts? Uh, bird strike is a huge issue um, in New York City. We're on the Eastern Migratory Corridor. So we have a lot of migratory birds coming through the city that can't literally detect the highly reflective skyscraper surfaces that we have. Um, and so what are a set of design techniques that you can use um, to help uh, mitigate those risks? And so this applies and influences our material selection uh, quite a great deal in our projects. And so this is that earlier project I showed that's a kind of green roof project at Columbia Medical Center where we've designed a bird safe windbreak. So there's a large glass panel along this flyway, but in it, it has a, a kind of ceramic frit pattern that's detectable to birds, but doesn't block the beautiful views that you have um, over. But also I think designing um, kind of cohabitat spaces also means really thinking about and designing for this concept of adaptive management, about thinking about how 
you maintain and monitor and transform landscapes over time, not simply through what's drawn on paper for a phase one implementation, but what, um, what, what recommendations a designer can offer over time as a landscape grows in, is invaded by different species, is colonized by different species. So even in our residential projects, this, this is a, the two images from a residential kind of restoration project that we did in Sag Harbor, um, which is out on Long Island, a, a relatively wealthy area of Long Island. Even in projects that are very conventional landscape architecture, we're trying to take unconventional and new methods of ecological analysis and monitoring and apply them here. So we have an adaptive management strategy uh, where we're helping this uh, resident maintain and um, selectively remove invasives from their property. So I would say this is just as much, it's not as imageable as some design products, um, but it is uh, just as much part of our, our process and our work. And so how, how do these uh, kind of larger concepts of designing for other species begin to impact our, um, our landscape work? And so I wanted to speak briefly on a project in Red Hook that we're working on where we've really thought about trying to design space both for people and for animals. Um, Red Hook is this neighborhood here. This is Lower Manhattan. This is New York City Harbor. Uh, and we kind of started and approached this project um, by just kind of looking and like asking this question of like what what can we do in New York City where we have so much interface with the water? We have so many coastal edges. There's so much opportunity for habitat here. Um, yet most of our coastal edges look like this. So I know you guys are here in Nebraska. You're not necessarily very close to the, the, the coastline, but you may be familiar with this technique of creating bulkheads along the edge straightening channels. This happens on riverways as well. Um, but this is the majority of what New York City's coastlines look like. A very hardened uh, edge where land has been filled out and you've created this kind of hard edge that does not support the whole host of ecosystems that uh, would naturally occur on a lower slope condition. Um, in Red Hook, you see riprap edges as well as uh, kind of bulkhead walls. And we were working on a project. Uh, we were invited to work with the developer on a public esplanade, a public park esplanade that's very, very long and narrow that was going to have a bulkhead. And it still has a bulkhead. And so we have this kind of denuded ecological condition and one of our thoughts was how do we make this better? Um, it's working in a site that has extreme flood risk. So it will flood, absolutely, in Sandy. Uh, this property was about four or five feet underwater. Uh, so every new type of um, architectural intervention needs to be lifted out of the floodplain according to building code. Again, it's about designing for uncertainty, about not knowing exactly how high the water will be over time, but how do you create a landscape that can anticipate that? Um, and so we're working with Foster and Partners, who's the architects, and they're designing two very long horizontal uh, commercial buildings. So it's almost like a skyscraper laid on end. It's a huge development footprint. Um, and it's an exciting project for us because we get to work on this little skinny stretch all the way around. Um, but what that means is it's a project that is very narrow in width. This is the mandated New York City Department of City Planning zoning for uh, waterfront parks required for uh, most urban development in New York City along the coastline that you develop a public waterfront esplanade in tandem with it. Uh, it has a 40 foot width and we're designing this park that's 40 feet wide by 700 feet by 400 feet by 700 feet. So it's a very, it's very much a landscape that is about edges. And it's a landscape that has a steep drop off in suction. It has that bulkhead condition. So how do we begin to deal with that? How do we design around that? Um, we thought a lot about uh, creating these three, these three different zones of not creating one monotonous system, but trying to design for diversity and design for different species in this design uh, and thinking about three different edges that intersect at the nose of the site. And this is kind of translated um, into this plan where each edge is unique, has a different geometric form, but it also allows water in in three different ways. And so for us, this was, this was really critical to do, but quite challenging to do. So we're working with this, this kind of cross section where there is still a bulkhead, but we're looking at dropping it, inviting the water in and creating that lower sloped condition that's so good for maritime habitat uh, and kind of very small edges of the site. 
And this has taken a lot of convincing, both with the many regulatory partners on the project, as well as the, the clients themselves. But I think everyone sees the value of this type of work. So these three blue zones is where we're inviting water into dry land. And uh, it, looks, it looks quite modest, I think, when you look at the scale of the site plan. But from a regulatory perspective and a client perspective, this is huge. This is incredible that we've been able to kind of get this far with this, this landscape proposal. But the important thing to remember is as this landscape changes over time, as it's hit with uh, potentially different flood conditions and sea level rise, uh, a, a great majority of this edge might actually be flooded. So we're not only designing to let water in on day one, we're designing to let water in over the long term. And each edge, I'm just going to flip through some of these sections of what the edge looks like today and what it will look like in the future. Um, but you'll see here how the waterfront edge uh, this is the, the historic maritime edge that faces some of the more historic properties, but how water is brought in here on this kind of long, narrow tidal shelf. So you can thank Brad Howe for many of these drawings. He's the graduate from the program. He's been working very intensively on this project, um, thinking not only about the larger concept, but really detailing it, looking at the cross sections, looking at how much water can be brought in along different points being inspired by the, the kind of deteriorated nature of the landscape itself, which the developers are not inspired by because their land is literally eroding and land is quite valuable in New York City. Um, but we're inspired by it and been thinking about how to have these moments that have uh, this feeling of erosion and collapse that bring the water in but um, preserve the longevity of the site over time. So this is, uh, these are just a lot of like design study images that have been used to communicate these ideas to the Department of City Planning and the Department of Environmental and Conservation that regulate this work, and some innovative techniques and materials that we're using uh, to stabilize some of these lower slope edges and create uh, maritime habitat. So this is a ecological concrete matrix um, that we're using uh, within this area where we're introducing the water that supports a whole host of uh, filter feeding and underwater organisms. I'm going to kind of flip through these very, very briefly, but what you can really see, I think, from all of these studies is the, the really diverse nature of this project and how each cross-section is different. And this is a, literally a landscape on the edge, on a slope. Um, in some areas, we've brought water in for habitat reasons, but in this area, we're actually introducing water into the site on top of the bulkhead uh, for recreational reasons, to allow for a kayak launch and more direct access for the, the neighbors to get to the water itself. Um, and then even on the, the roof level of the project, we're thinking about it as a kind of urban cohabitat uh, kind of experiment where we're dealing with a relatively uh, large, very large surface. Um, it cannot support a lot of weight, so a very thin uh, soil buildup. But we're trying to create an ecological experiment where we plant wind-pollinated species on one roof and insect-pollinated species on another roof and potentially monitor those over time. So, Within all of our projects, we're always looking for opportunities to expand the range of clients and species that we're designing for, but we're also looking for opportunities to experiment. And so I'm going to speak for about five more minutes. So I hopefully won't run over too long. Um, but I think these ideas, this idea of revive, of cohabit, of engage, they're all embedded in all of our work. Uh, and we have one project in particular uh, that kind of really scales up these ideas and brings them all together and operates across a whole variety of scales. Uh, and that's this project called Living Breakwaters, which is built on a lot of these concepts. It's uh, very much um, been a driver of some of the work that we're doing in Red Hook with the edge experimentation and the material experimentation. And it's also a project that uh, kind of originated with oyster texture, this con uh, conceptual proposal for the Museum of Modern Art where we tried to design a, a living infrastructure for climate change. And so Living Breakwaters was a, another competition project that is now moving into kind of full design and documentation and is funded for implementation. And it was done through the, uh, the Housing and Urban Development uh, Rebuild by Design program or competition. And so our project won funding for that work and, it, and it's moving forward through that mechanism. And so this project really aims to, to do all these things together, to think about physical adaptation, reducing risk for these vulnerable neighborhoods, uh, 
cultural and kind of social resiliency, trying to bring people into this process, uh, and also ecological resiliency, thinking about in, uh, kind of uh, integrating ecology into our definition of a uh, resilient uh, kind of sustainable shoreline. So Rebuild by Design was put together to um, have different communities come up with design solutions after Hurricane Sandy that were not simply based upon rebuilding, but were based upon innovation and design and building a more adaptive and resilient shore. And so when we began this project, we really looked at uh, a whole host of different coastal ecosystems and identified uh, shallow water areas as a place that had a lot of opportunity to intervene within and design um, landscapes that really integrated uh, risk reduction, ecological resilience, and social infrastructure. And so we began to call these landscapes the shallows, that the shallow water area is a really uh, kind of a common thread in our work. We're often working within these zones. Um, but that shallow water landscapes have a lot of opportunity because you're not simply thinking about um, building a singular piece of infrastructure, a single flood wall, or a single kind of method of uh, community protection from rising waters or um, in intense storm events, but really because shallow waters offer this long transect to create a layered approach to risk reduction and resiliency, um, where multiple different types of coastal infrastructure can also be overlaid with different ways of occupying and engaging the water itself, which is fundamentally the reason why many people live in these areas, because they love the water and want to be near the water, even though it can be quite risky uh, to live along the edge. And the neighborhood that we began to work with uh, was called um, Tottenville on the south shore of Staten Island. We looked at this whole larger stretch and we realized that while flooding was an issue in Tottenville, one of the bigger, more deadlier issues uh, was this issue of wave action, of intense storms where high intensity waves were hitting the shoreline. Um, it's one of the reasons people died during Hurricane Sandy in a neighborhood was because their house was blown off the foundation by a large wave. But also over time it's led to quite a lot of land loss in Staten Island. It's just it's part of the, 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 the kind of natural process uh, for this area. But because we've developed in a static way, we are suffering the consequences of that. So beaches are damaged. The, the kind of erosive processes are quite clear when you walk along the shoreline. And we developed this approach of using a relatively traditional method of coastal engineering as a, uh, a kind of way of protecting, uh, reducing risk within this neighborhood. And so we chose this, this technique of breakwaters, which are not a continuous flood wall, but a staggered kind of necklace or archipelago of constructed islands that reduce wave action over time. Um, they also can build beaches over time, depending upon the proximity and distance that they're built to the shore. So they have a responsive effect on the shore. And they do a lot of things, but they also don't do a lot of things. So they're not a, a silver bullet approach. We're not taking the attitude of the shoreline community will never be flooded. We're trying to make sure that if and when it is flooded, because flooding seems inevitable in the future, uh, it will flood in a way that is more reliable, more safe, with lower velocity water. Uh, but we're also thinking about breakwaters as a way of encouraging more occupation and use of the shallow water zone, but also creating more habitat. And so the, the proposal for living breakwaters is really to take this, this conventional piece of shoreline infrastructure, apply it in a unique way, and make it a more ecologically and socially robust uh, kind of uh, instance in the neighborhood. So it's about this larger cycle of infrastructure creation, of uh, the, it, the uh, kind of finding and creating places for engagement for the water. So we had an architectural strategy of water hubs of, of places that would host programming for people to be able to use the shallow water zone um, and also ecosystem development within the shallow water area, which has been uh, very impacted by bulkhead construction in New York City. And so this is an image from the competition of the living breakwaters themselves, of these bio-enhanced breakwaters uh, that do many different things um, and, and, and add habitat across a whole gradient uh, of a whole like, transect of ecosystems. And what you're seeing here is a breakwater that will reduce wave action on the storm surge side, uh, but would operate even in a smaller storm event like a nor'easter and calm the shoreline and help grow the shoreline and help create a buffer uh, for those erosive processes. Ecology is a huge part of it. Boosting the ecology of this area is really critical, but it's not just critical from a 
um, biological perspective. It's critical from an economic, an infrastructure, and an educational perspective. And that a stronger ecosystem uh, is, is an outreach tool for the neighborhood, but is also can literally make this infrastructure stronger. Like biogenic buildup of these different creatures can help improve the strength of the breakwaters over time. And when we began to look at ecosystems, we had to think very carefully and deeply about what ecosystems to engage and how to design for these species. So again, trying to take uh, into account interspecies design and thinking from the perspective of a different animal. And so we thought initially about uh, shellfish and fish, and both of those uh, organisms are uh, kind of designed for within the project. But as we began to look closer, we realized that we couldn't just design for any fish. We really had to design for juvenile fish because this is where uh, juvenile fish live within the larger system of spawning uh, that happens up the Hudson River and uh, ocean-going adults, which literally travel the world. So in New York Harbor, our project area is located where the juvenile fish are and where they need more habitat. And so we began to really think about designing spaces within the breakwater that are at the scale of a juvenile fish, of a of much smaller fish. So we're taking something like a typical breakwater, we're modifying its form to avoid uh, critical habitat within the area. We're trying to create micro-scale complexity within this space. We're calling them reef streets. We're basically adding space to the breakwaters to create more habitat for juvenile fish. Uh, and we're orienting that structure, or those reef streets, <coughs> towards the waves. So that small, poor space that juvenile fish really need to locate and hide from predators never fills up with sediment because it's always getting high intensity wave action hitting it. And so these reef streets, I think, are a really unique and kind of fun aspect of the design. And we're beginning to design them more and more. Um, but they're essentially these, these kind of smaller fingers that extend from the breakwater and create habitat for fish to feed, but also to hide and shelter in the structure. And we're using some of those same materials, that ecological concrete, um, which has a different chemical composition, but also has a different texture that's, again, designed for the scale of the species. So very, very small baby fish will actually hide and locate around these highly textured surfaces, which have two textures built into them, a macro and a micro. Um, we love oysters as an office, so they're kind of obviously a piece of this proposal. And they're a really big piece of the history, again, of Staten Island, in that the South Shore, and especially this neighborhood, Tottenville, uh, used to be known as the town the oyster built. There was a really robust, strong oyster economy here. Um, they've also become a huge educational tool for us. It's really about reaching out to people, um, you know, speaking to the history of the neighborhood, but also getting into schools and working with uh, the, the, the stewards of this project in the future. So we're working with a lot of Staten Island schools and we're collaborating with a school called the Harbor School, which is a school that bases its whole curriculum around New York City's harbor um, to, to teach teachers. This is a teacher training event that some students ran for us, which is really excellent. Um, but to teach teachers how to bring their students to the shore and incorporate oyster gardening and monitoring into their, their work. As part of one of our tools of engagement during the competition, we made an oyster gardening manual um, that, that helped kind of um, facilitate this process. And now we have a number of schools working on um, gardening oysters along the shore. And so oyster populations really tanked a couple of um, many decades ago in New York City, and they're on the rebound. And now all of these students are very much a part of that, of that process. And so I'll end with just a couple of slides on the implementation of this project, because it was a very exciting competition to participate in um, and, and incredible for our office. Uh, and now it's moving in a very real way towards development. Scape continues to be the lead designer. So we are the prime on this project, which is huge, because it's very rare for a landscape architectural office to be priming a, what's essentially an engineering project. And we're collaborating and coordinating with a number of um, engineers on this work. And the reality of, of, of working on projects of this scale is that we're, they require quite a lot of data collection. So for almost a year, we've been doing data collection with a really diverse team, documenting the existing habitat, documenting the bathymetric conditions, looking uh, in a very nuanced way at all of these different ecosystems and uh, soil and substrate conditions that exist along the shore, um, assessing artificial habitat to see what kinds of species might come to the breakwaters, so a lot of analysis involved, and thinking about taking our competition proposal and really getting down in the weeds of material design. So 
the earlier image is what we proposed the competition. This is a more realistic cross section of what we're now proposing and advancing. Um, and what you'll see from some of these slides and images uh, is that the materials really influence the kind of future habitats of the space. So we're trying to think about the breakwaters providing habitats for underwater organisms, but also for um, uh, larger marine mammals like the harbor seal, which is coming back to New York Harbor, and needs places to be actually be able to, to breach and to get out of the water and have shelter that's not directly along the shoreline. And so it's, it's moving into a really kind of interesting moment. I'm going to skip through these slides and end um, with one video that our office developed, which really showcases some of the collaborative work that's happening um, with engineers. So one of the things we've learned with this process is that we really can't design alone. Like as designers, we have great ideas, but our ideas are much better when we design with a wider group of people. And with Living Breakwaters, we've been working with a number of different engineering offices to test the breakwaters and to iterate uh, what configurations are best for this particular stretch of shore with its particular wave and sediment conditions. Um, and so this is the kind of 30% design scenario that we've landed upon. Um, these are some more images that, that Brad made, a kind of parametric model of, of different breakwater configurations and sizes, different configurations that we've studied, um, different modeling results that have been derived from them. Uh, but also, this video really kind of showcases that process of, of iterative design. And so I think I might end right now, because I've spoken quite a bit, and you probably have questions. But I'm going to let the video play in the background. It shows uh, historic shoreline change of the environment over time. And it shows 15 of our design scenarios that we've been iterating with engineers to develop a scenario, put it into the model, test how it's performing, bring it back to the office, work with those engineers to redesign it, test it again. So it's an incredibly iterative and unique process. And we're exciting to kind of be at the forefront of this type of work. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Yeah. Great. Questions? Yes. Oh, I think we're supposed to use the microphone. Sorry. OK. that you're trying to repair? I know that um, do you give parameters to your construction crews and like make sure that they're eliminating damage? Yeah, no, th and that, that's, that's one of the kind of really critical things. And if I was only lecturing about this project, I would get into that a little bit more because it's definitely one of the first questions that the regulators are very interested in. Because even though uh, New York City's underwater habitat has been highly denuded over time, it's highly compromised, it's very monolithic, it's not diverse, it's essentially a very uh, muddy seafloor in a lot of areas. Um, it's really critical not to displace more habitat than you're trying to engender on a site. And so we did a couple of things with this work. Even in the competition phases, we had that very question of like, what exists here that should be protected? How should we make sure not to negatively impact that? And we talked to the Department of Environmental Conservation, and they said, well, there's not any great maps. <laughs> there's not a lot of information about the underwater world. Um, like when you look at the GIS data set of the data that's available onshore in Staten Island, there's you know huge numbers of layers of environment, endangered species, other um, kind of land use assets. When you look underwater, it's just blue. It's just one thing. And we all know the underwater world is not a monotonous environment, so it's kind of a challenge. One of the things we did during the competition was actually go out and meet with a group of hard clammers who were using this area as a um, as economic, as a place to harvest clams and sell clams uh, on the market. And the DEC recommended that we do that. And they helped us draw a map of the seafloor. So that was like a useful tool for working in a very high level way of how different clams set different years in different places on the shore and places we should avoid. It was pretty fascinating because we found that a lot of clams actually set most on the edges of the constructed channel because that intercepted f the free-floating clams in the water, and they landed there. So the artificial construction was actually the best habitat for clams. And we're not allowed to touch the channel anyway, so we avoided that area. Um, 
But as we've moved forward into be working on this 30% design process and implementation process, we're doing a lot of on-site data collection itself. So we're working with ecologists, we're working with the regulators to look at the existing ecosystems. Um, but that one strategy of the artificial habitat assessment is also part of that because um, if you only look at the ecosystems that exist, that have been highly impacted, you're only looking at a very narrow range of possible species. So in addition to trying to evaluate um, habitats that we should not touch or should not impact, we also looked at habitats that had been highly impacted and had some of these riprap areas with smaller pore spaces installed, like the bases of lighthouses, uh, channel markers in the water. And we actually found there was a much more diverse kind of cast of species locating around those structures because that habitat was more similar to habitat that had existed in the past that had disappeared due to uh, dredging and the, the loss of oyster reefs in that area. So the riprap was almost acting as a constructed um, oyster reef habitat, which is highly generative of a number of different species. So we've had to kind of like, you know, really, really push the bar in terms of ecosystem assessment to not only think about impacting what is there, but trying to project what type of ecology could be self-sustaining in this area. But the whole project is a pilot in a lot of ways too. So there's five or six different techniques that we're using to restore oysters along the breakwaters. And we plan to, in the same way I talked about that residential project, we're planning to monitor and have an adaptive, um, uh, uh, kind of ad adaptive management plan for the whole project over time. So it's not fixed in stone. The, uh, the graphics showed the breakwaters just kind of plunk down on whatever material there is. What does your geotech consultant tell you about what they're sitting on? Yeah. Because there's going to be a lot of force put onto those things. It's like a retaining wall or a building. You, it seems to me if you don't have a decent foundation, it's just going to fall apart. Yeah, and that, that was one of the main criteria that we spent about a year look doing data collection for was sediment samples to look at the amount of sediment moving through the system but also the geotechnical borings to see the kind of conditions of the ground but are they so just sitting on sediment they so we have established that a, a huge majority of the site is a stable enough sand to construct breakwaters of this size on without um, any kind of uh, subterranean reinforcement that has to happen we're likely using a, a marine mattress um, in some parts of it, that's that's still kind of being discussed by some of the engineers. But it's definitely it's definitely impacted where we can and can't locate breakwaters. So our our in the competition phase, you know, we had this like huge footprint that we were looking at, and that's really shrunk based upon the data collection that we've done. It's a big piece of it. I think one last question. Great. I just wanted to ask about the sort of size of team that is put together for a project like this. How many consultants <laughs> do you have? And it's, it's a large project. So. It's, a large, it's a large project that really keeps growing. So um, when we did the competition, I think there were seven uh, kind of formal partners on the team. So it's led by scape, Landscape Architecture. We had an architect as a sub-consultant. Low Tech was the architect. Uh, we had Parsons Brinkerhoff, who's a large engineering firm. We had the Stevens Institute who was doing some very uh, high level early coastal uh, hyd hydrodynamic modeling for the work. Uh, and then we also had CRC Consulting who's developing that ecological concrete product and their marine biologists now working on the project. And we had the Harbor School, which was uh, the, the high school in New York City that bases their whole curriculum around the water and is doing a lot of oyster restoration. So that was already a large team and it meant a lot of huge meetings around the table. and. Collaboration is incredible, but it's also very time consuming. So it's something you really have to, to not only factor into your projects, but you have to budget for. I think it's made an incredible project and it's really improved the process, but it's something that clients don't always understand from the beginning because they want to reduce the team as much as possible, save money, save time. As it's moved into implementation, we've only expanded the, um, most of the number of engineers working on the project. So we have Ocean and Coastal Consulting, who was actually on the original team too. They're doing the, the full documentation of the breakwater system. Um, we have MFS and Prudent, who are two engineers working on a lot of the, some of the geotechnical work and some of the um, habitat assessment work. 
AKRF is contracted independently and they're doing the environmental review. It's going through a, a kind of environmental permitting process as well in tandem. Um, and Arcadis has been brought in to do a lot of the, um, we've moved beyond hydrodynamic modeling. That video I was just showing uh, is a shoreline change modeling that's also relatively high level. As we move into the next phase of design, which is 60% design, we're doing a kind of full integrated Delft 3D model, which is uh, will look both at water quality, sediment, and hydrodynamic action over time. So it is not a simple process. And we're just one sub, you know, we're one design team working on the project. There's the whole host of people involved from the regulatory perspective. The project is held by the state governor's office of storm recovery. They're implementing it. They have a whole host of legal consultants as, and policy consultants and others working on it. So it's not a short answer to your question. <laughs> it's a very large team. It's a very large team. Uh, I think we, I think we're making some money. Yeah, I don't know what I'm <laughs> authorized authorized to share there, but it's it's a. Um, I, I think what we're mostly doing is we're learning quite a bit, and we are setting up a kind of new framework that elevates the role of landscape architects in what in a process that typically landscape architects aren't really involved in, and so that's been incredible for us. I would say we might be making money, but we're also uh, bearing a huge amount of risk that landscape architecture often does not bear professionally. So it's another like whole new territory for design practice in our work. I'm happy to kind of stick around too and answer questions. I know I went a little over, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.